Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. I got a little cold, so bear with me. But thank you all for being here for Coffee with the Mayor. And I have a couple guests today. I have Candy and Tanya, and they're in the clerk's department. They're going to go first, and they're going to talk about the election. So if you have any questions about the elections, these are the two experts. Mm -hmm. So go ahead, Candy. Hey, well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So I'm Candy, your clerk, and then we also have your deputy clerk, your Tanya, who's kind of walk through this. Oh, I have to open. <laughs> um, so anyways, this is a little different than your copies. I apologize the staples in the right-hand corner, so it's a little bit of a challenge this morning <laughs> for me. And I'm dealing with the cold, too, so I'm we'll trying to get through this. So um, I'm just going to talk through a few simple things and then open it up to any questions that you might have. But important dates to remember coming up for this November 5th um, election is Next week, October 16th, is the deadline for you to register by mail or online if you're not already registered or if you have somebody that you know has moved and needs to register. Um, that is the deadline. After that date, they can register in the clerk's office or on election day. So, um, October 22nd is the first day for in-person absentee voting. Um, that's when you can come in and cast an absentee ballot in the clerk's office. Uh, we have, um, I have the dates coming up in the next slide, or the, the days and the times. October 31st is a deadline if you still want a ballot, if you're a regular or overseas voter, if you want it to be mailed to you. Um, it might make it to you, it does need to get back to us on election day by 8 p.m. So um, November 1st, that's Friday before the election, the deadline if you're definitely confined or military, not active away, um, is, is the deadline to have a ballot mailed to you on that date. I'm not sure that's going to make it to you um, in order to get it back to us, but yeah. you have that option. Um, In-person absentee voting hours. So that begins Tuesday, October 22nd uh, through Friday, October 25th. We're available at 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Yes? Is that like early voting? Yes. Is that similar? Yes. So in Wisconsin, we only do absentee voting. The media has turned it into early voting. You're casting your vote, but that ballot's gonna go in an envelope and sealed up and we put it in our vault and lock it up until election day. That's when it's counted. Mm -hmm. So this starts October, Tuesday, October 22nd through Friday, October 25th. And it's 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. At, at City Hall. Saturday, October 26th, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Monday, October 28th, through Thursday, October 31st, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then Friday, November 1st, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. So there's no voting after Friday, November 1st. So who needs to register to vote if you're not registered currently? So if a voter has never registered before, has moved or changed their name, they must register to vote. They live in the city Stoughton limits, not the townships. So you can go right now to myvote.wi.gov and um, it will show the voters your correct polling location and voters may only register to vote at their polling place on election day. So you can do it on election day as well. Um, if you have a new address, you have had to have lived there 28 consecutive days prior to the election. So that date was October 8th. If you move after October 8th, you have to vote at your previous polling place. So if you move within the city, you'll go to your previous polling location and vote there. If you move from Madison to Stoughton um, yesterday, you have to go back to your Madison polling place and vote. Okay. So voter registration, some of the qualifications, you have to be 18 years of age or older. You have to be a U.S. citizen. You may not be a convicted felon serving any portion of your sentence, and you must have lived at your, 20, your current address for 28 days or more. And these are some of the items, and they're in your packet. So these are the items that um, we can accept as far as um, your proof of residence. So, so just so you know, there's a difference here, and this one is often confused. Proof of residence is used to determine where you live in the city. So when registering someone, we are making sure we get them registered at the right address and the right district. A photo ID 
can be a proof of residence if it has your current address on it. So the photo ID then is used on when you're voting. So in-person voting um, on election day or, or voting absentee, or even if you're requesting a ballot be held to you, we need to see your photo ID, unless you apply as an indefinitely confined person. So the photo ID um, is shown at the polls and it just shows who you are. It can have your previous address on it. You just wanna see your picture and, and accept that photo as reasonably looks like you. So. And this is the application um, for, uh, and I did bring some today, I did bring some voter registration forms and some applications for an ap um, absentee ballot. This is what the absentee ballot application looks like. If you choose to, down here at the bottom is the spot where you, you can choose um, for a specific election, you can choose for the calendar year. That means it's good from January 1st to December 31st, and then it expires and you have to reapply the following year. Or the bottom option is indefinitely confined. And I know it's hard to read, but basically this is stating that you're indefinitely confined due to age, illness, disability, or infirmity. We don't ask, but it exempts you um, from the photo ID, and we will always mail you a ballot. So, if you do not return a ballot, we send you a letter and let you know that you didn't return that ballot, and um, you sign the letter and send it back that you want to remain indefinitely confined, or you can ignore it and we remove you from the list. And then you'll have to reapply or go to the polls and vote. So, uh, some of the pictures that are um, acceptable photo IDs. So. Typically, most people have a driver's license or, or a state ID, uh, but these are some of the other options that you can use uh, to vote, either by absentee or at the polls. Any of this can be um, expired since November 8th, 2022. So, Candy? Oh, yes. Yes. If they no longer have a driver's license, if they've you can, say, that. you can get a state issued ID, it's free, the DMV does it, and we have um, information that should have brought that along. So we can, you can do that through the de uh, DMV department, and they actually have, have extended hours to accommodate people. It's free, and that's non-expiring, so that's good forever. But if you have a passport or something, that's acceptable as well. So once again, I'm probably going to do the early voting. Mm -hmm. and do I have to fill out one of those forms to them? Like so you if you come into our office, by you standing there, we Hi. go into the system and it's classified as in-person absentee voting. So you're only going to get an absentee ballot for that election. It won't qualify you for the follow, like an election next year. So it's just for that one location. Okay. Yep, yep. So a couple questions that came up in previous elections. One was the Dropbox. Oh, yes. So our Dropbox is open. Um, it was open and available for the August election, and it is open now. So if you do have an absentee ballot, you can, it's behind City Hall um, in the third drive through lane. And you'll see it, there's a big sign that says um, ballot Dropbox. Um, it's secured, it's underneath cameras 24 seven, underneath lights, underneath the roof. You can drop your ballot in there. We go out there two to three times a day, um, cut the seals, take the ballots out, two people, and lock it back up and take it in, and we check your ballot in, and into the vault they go. And the other one is, is can you drop off somebody else's ballot? So... Uh, <laughs> That's a tough one, right? Yeah, that one's, uh, it's kind of in litigation. So. Basically, if you're bringing in someone else's ballot, we're going to ask you, is this your ballot? If you say no, then we'll ask you, does this voter have a reason that they can't bring this ballot in? If you tell us they have a disability, they can't get out of the car, they can't get out of the house right now, we're going to take that ballot. We don't check IDs or anything like that. If you tell us that they just don't feel like dropping it off, Legally, we're really not supposed to take that ballot. So we're not going to take that ballot. We're going to tell you, take it to the mailbox and you can drop it in there. Because they all come with postage on them. So that we never deny anyone, you know. A stamp could cost um, someone, it could be a, how do I want to say this? 
prohibiting. That's the word. <laughs> Thank you. I brought her along for that. That's my only contribution. <laughs> could, could, could come up with that name uh, or that word. Um, so there's always postage on your ballots when we send them out to you. So you can drop them in the mail and they'll come back to us. Post office in Stoughton is just incredible. They do an awesome job. They will call us and let us know that they might have a bunch of ballots that need to be delivered. They will run them over in town at you know, 6 o'clock at night. They're knocking on the door. They're calling me. They make sure your ballot gets to us. And we take them out to the proper polling location so they can get voted. So. What should people expect on election day? I would expect some lines. Um, so we have electronic poll books. If you have not voted in person um, in a while, uh, we started using those in 22. So, and they are no longer the paper poll book that everyone's used to. Um, it's an electronic poll book. So you sign in on that, you're going to sign your name just like you did on the paper poll books. Um, but everything's electronic, they can scan your, if you have a license or an ID, they scan it and you're, you're right there. Um, they seem to get everybody moving through pretty quickly. Um, we added additional voting booths because the Badger books were getting people through so fast that we had people waiting for a voting booth. So we have additional voting booths as well. Um, I would anticipate a little bit of line uh, basically throughout the day. Mornings are always very busy, so um, maybe that 10 to 12 might be a little less. Uh, Mid-afternoon might be less lines. 4 o'clock on, I anticipate lines until 8 o'clock. All right, my last question is, is, do you have enough poll workers? We could use some. If anybody's interested, I did not bring applications down. So uh, we have an application. We um, Everybody that volunteers uh, goes through a background check. And after that's done, then Tanya's been really great at sending you the training. We have training. Uh, we have, what, maybe eight positions? Seven, yeah, and this eight. year we're doing four-hour shifts. Yep. Um, to sort of accommodate people's schedules. We heard, you know, childcare might have been, again, a prohibitive factor yeah. or work and they wanted to come at night. So, or they just wanted to work a four hour shift and get out and get in. Um, so we have about eight ish four hour shifts left still. And those are, you know, greeter positions, um, which are going to be helping people find out if it's their polling location. Um, tabulator or ballot box position. So some sort of, you know, lower, lower, not badger book positions where you have to use a device. Um, so yeah, if you want to take advantage of a four hour shift, we would love to have you. Yeah. Who's ready to sign up? <laughs> <laughs> I saw one hand in the back. All right, there's still more. So yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I forgot to bring some applications, but we certainly can, you know, get you an application and we'd love to have more people on board. Yeah. So, and we have some recordings in regards to training that, um, and we actually just did some yesterday in regards to each the smaller, the, I don't know if I was a smaller position, but like the ballot box, the tabulator, to help you understand okay. what goes on at that position. So, I'll run some, I'll run some up. Yeah, while well, you guys are still here. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions for the clerks? Any threats? Any, uh, that you're a we don't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're good. We're good. Good. We're good. Yep. Did you talk about observers at all? As far as um, if somebody creates chaos at the polls, are you I, ready for that? I didn't. Are we ready? We've had some security training with PD. Um, we anticipate observers. Uh, we are meeting with our chief inspectors and we're going to make sure we're all on the same um, plate in regards to what we'll do. You can't, I mean, we can't really just put it down in writing. Nothing is, we're going to have to deal with the situations as they arise. So it's a chief inspector that determines do we need PD immediately. Um, each polling location has a radio that goes straight to PD. PD has extra officers on assignment. Um, we've been asked, are we going to have officers stationed? No, that's intimidation. So um, yeah. will officers be driving around? Yes. 
Um, we also will have officers delivering us, or delivering the absentee ballots. If somebody votes absentee, we seal them up and then we take them to the polling locations and officers will be driving us around for that. Um, we don't know what to expect as far as observers go. But there are rules for observers. There are rules, yes. So they do sign in, they wear a label, we will tape off spots. They have to be three to eight feet away from the back of your book, uh, like the absentee ballot processing area. Like when you come to the polls, um, our people that are processing absentee ballots are kind of set back with the chief inspector. There's two people doing that, and they have their own tabulator, and they do have little signs on their back that says I'm processing absentee ballots, so you know that they're not, you know, running a bunch of ballots into the machine. They're making your vote count, so they can process 10 at a time. So, um, yeah, we, we expect observers, and we'll be as prepared as we can for them. So. Any other questions? Go ahead. Well, this is really just a comment. I've worked before as a poll yes. worker in another state, beautiful Michigan, and I was impressed as I throughout the whole procedure at how fail-safe it is. It's virtually impossible to cheat that day, and um, I just wanted to make that as a personal observation. It, so much has been done, you know, in the media. It, you know, it's just not going to happen. There is no cheating. I've been a poll worker also in Wisconsin, and it, I, I agree with her. It is virtually impossible. Thank you for that. I know we've had like random recounts and things like that over the years too. So there are things in place to to do that. Yeah, if it doesn't come out the same, you've got to recount. So, uh, so I anticipate for Stoughton, um, I wouldn't be surprised if I'm not asked to do an audit uh, by the county. Um, we haven't done an audit in Stoughton. It's been maybe four years. So they, the county will pick a city and a village and a township, and the audit, basically, they tell you what you're going to recount. So it'll be like one position on the ballot, and you go through, it's an entire recount process, tabulating, counting, and tabulating by hand everything to make sure that the tapes, what the tapes report, what the machines report, are exactly what we have in those, that went into those machines. So I anticipate for this election that City of Stone may get called up for that. So, so we pull in a whole you know, gamut of our chief inspectors and inspectors and, and go through a recount process. For that position so um, we're also prepared for overall a recount um, in the state um, kind of a thing yeah I think there's like something that sets that off like if it's so close it would be an automatic one yeah. and then yeah. somebody could request one if it's within a margin I believe. Yeah. so we're just kind of planning maybe Thanksgiving <laughs> <laughs> I might get a Thanksgiving <laughs> This election hopefully um, will be done, but um, it may go to the, uh, we have, it. I can't remember, it's like 45 days to, to reconcile, but if there's a recount, then that extends it. So um, it could go on for a while. We'll see. So. Any other questions? All right, otherwise you're gonna run some applications run back. Yeah. For folks that are here that wanna sign up yeah. for the polls, we appreciate your interest. They do a great job training. I don't know if anyone that's here has been through their training. How has that gone for you? Beautiful. Yeah. Give them a raise. <laughs> <laughs> I told you what I'd have to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to call us, um, email us. Yeah. Um, we're, we're here to help you and, and walk through the process if you're concerned or have questions about stuff. Thanks, everyone. we have an amazing team and there's other folks at City Hall that support their efforts as well as they come in. Uh, we have Deb and Miranda at the front desk. Um, they also help when people come in and answer questions, show them how to register.
sister, uh, Sue Stranley, is also there at City Hall. She's been a poll worker in the past as well. So we're, we're blessed that we have a lot of people that have had experience in the elections because we know that there's going to be a large turnout um, for this one that is less than a month away. So I'll go through some slides. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask, and we'll see what I have on here. Um, street projects, I just added some stuff on there the other day. We've had uh, some projects that have finished up. Uh, most of them have been on schedule, except for the one over on West South Street. That one we've had a real challenge with, and I see Charles over there chuckling because it's near his neighborhood. And yes. I'm kind of thinking just... that maybe that side of town is cursed. <laughs> I'll agree with that. <laughs> I will definitely agree with that. So it's been a struggle. The crew has been out there. They've had some issues. And the most recent one is one of the pipes that they put underground isn't really laying in there properly. So I think they're going to have to redo that one, which is causing delays. So um, we have things built into contracts. It's called liquidated damages. So if a project doesn't get completed on time, basically the contractors get a daily fine for every day that <coughs> the road's not done when it's supposed to be per their contract. Um, and we just want them to finish the road and have it done right. We're not there to try to make money off the contractor. So we, we work with them as best as we can, but at the end of the day, we need to hold them accountable. So hopefully having that contract language in there will get them to work the extra hours and do the extra things that they need to do to ensure that that project is completed properly. Uh, another big one that we're working on is 4th Street down by the library. And according to Director Abier, um, if the weather holds up, they're planning on um, putting asphalt down the week of the uh, 21st. So hopefully by the end of October, 4th Street will be done. Um, that's kind of a big project because it's down by the library and the public safety building. So we've been holding some of our meetings at the fire station instead because it's just easier to maneuver and park and get in and out of there. So if you're watching a city council meeting or a planning commission meeting and the background looks different, or if you try to attend a meeting, they've been down at the fire station. They probably will be until the end of the month. Um, some of the other ones, uh, Ashbury and Cedarbrook, that's down on the far end of town, kind of behind Weevil World back in there. And those uh, areas there, um, that's kind of our first effort this year. We bought a piece of equipment called the zipper. And what that does is it grinds off the uh, asphalt um, basically down to the dirt. And then we regrade the road. Our crews do all this work. And then we get it prepped so it's ready to be paved by a paving company. And we're going to knock off a few projects every year, which basically has that pay for the equipment that we purchased to do it. Uh, gives us flexibility. We can do that uh, whenever our schedule allows us. So we can do it between other projects. We can do it between um, the weather. Um, so that's really the first project this year we're going to use with the equipment that we purchased. Last year we did a test run with equipment from the manufacturer that they basically brought in to do a demonstration, and that was down by uh, Venable kind of going down toward the disc golf area down there. So, um, and that one turned out really well, so we're optimistic about the future of that. Um, back behind here, they're doing a, what they call a hydraulic, hydromatic separator, and that's something that we received a DNR grant. So if you go back here on Washington Street, it's all tore up, they're installing that right now, and that basically helps filter some stuff in the sewer, I believe, or stormwater before it gets to the river. So we have a couple projects we've done over the years where we've uh, received uh, grant funds from the DNR to do that. So that one should be wrapping up here uh, fairly soon. And then the other one, um, they're doing some work and some alley work right now as well. And um, hopefully those will all be finished up here probably as we get into November. Once it gets into November, the temperature starts changing. It's really hard to do paving. So everybody's pushing to get these projects done as soon as they can. And uh, they need to pass inspections as well. So we don't want to pour something if we don't think it's going to cure properly and end up, end up having to redo it next year anyway. This is kind of the picture of Washington Street. 
feedback here. So um, that one should be wrapping up fairly quickly. Yeah, so it's trying to separate material in the stormwater before it gets to the river. That's what it. Tim? Yes. Um, we, we live off of racetrack, and we were told by some of the public works people that our walking path is going to get paved this year. Yeah, so they're, that's one that they're trying to fit in um, within some other projects. Originally, we didn't have money budgeted for that, but based on community input, we've been having a lot of issues with that washing away. We yeah. had a lot of rain in this year, early yeah, it's in bad. the year. <laughs> Not much lately. No. Uh, but for a while there, it was like every other day, and then you'd have to mow somehow in between. Um, so we're still hoping to get that project done. Um, and I think Brett's trying to coordinate the paving with these other projects that are going on. It's hard to get somebody to come down and just do a small area. Right. So what we try to do is say, while well, we have this big project we're doing, and while you're here, we'd like you to do this one as well. I don't have a timetable on that because I don't know which crew is doing it. Hopefully it's not the West South crew. <laughs> <laughs> it is a Bible get done. But I'm hoping maybe it's the 4th Street crew. Uh, those guys have been doing a really good job. Um, but I can follow up on that and, and see when that's going to get done. Okay, thanks. Sure. It might be part of the crew that's working out at Man Park as well. Um, that's the next one. And so this one I've talked about in the past. Uh, right now these guys are ahead of schedule. The weather has been really favorable for them. That's true. Um, so right now they're really working on uh, setting the new pillars to mount the grandstand on. I, I see some cement in the ground. Uh, that'll probably take a week or two for that cement to cure before they can relocate the grandstand to the permanent spot. The grass is already growing, so that looks good. Um, and then they're gonna focus on this row here. Um, the parking, and then this area up here will be done more than likely in the spring. Um, We'll see how far they get. We we want to make sure we don't get to what I would call a point of no return and start pushing uh, construction into the fair season. So ideally, if we can finish it up before the fair, that's what we'll do. But if we decide that we're getting to that point of no return, we'll cut it off at a place where it's not going to impact the fair, <coughs> and then finish the work uh, sometime, you know, in July or August of next year. Uh, which will include that parking lot. So we're looking forward to that being done. I know the Opera House is talking about in the next couple of years, trying to schedule a bigger show down there as a fundraiser. Um, in addition to their catfish music, <coughs> we can just simply get more people down there than we can over by the fire station or in the Opera House. Um, they did a presentation the other night at City Council, and that's one of the things that they would like to do. So this kind of just shows the area in the red that they're focusing on right now. Like you said, they're making really good progress. So there won't be any road along the river? No, oh, along, along the river, there'll be a trail here. So if they come in, there's some internal circulation going on. We anticipate during the fair, what they'll do is they'll barricade right about here <laughs> like a vendor that needs to get into those barns to drop off animals. There's no reason for the public to come back here during the fair because you want them to park up here or park on the road. These here will be uh, uh, ADA accessible parking here for physically disabled people will be able to park here, which will be nice. It will be designated just for that. And then there will be some additional parking here, but for the most part, we don't need the public traveling this road. There's no reason for them to be back there. Um, unless, you know, during the regular season, if there's no fair going on, then they would come back here and they can park here to play pickleball. Or they can, you know, come around and deliver the wastewater or go to the bus garage. They can circle around and come back out. We've widened the road and we put in this curve to make it easier because this corner here by this um, shed here is kind of a pinch point. So we've tried to make it easier to maneuver. Eventually these buildings will all be down in kind of this footprint here, which will create some more um, opportunities there. Um, and as, as the community grows, you know, we anticipate someday maybe um, moving the aquatic center out of there, maybe the, the skate bowling will be in a different site, and then, you know, maybe even a bus 
fire in the garage. Uh, we have to leave space available for the expansion of the wastewater. So for now, we're kind of holding on to some space down here, but eventually it might be advantageous to have this space here for wastewater as the community grows, especially if someday the DNR decides that we need to do more treatment for things like PFAS or some chemicals that we don't even know about right now. Um, but for the most part, uh, we're good. We have the capacity down there to handle what we have. Um, and we'll be doing some updates down there in the next several years um, to the plant. A lot of the pumps and things like that are getting old. Has anyone ever toured the wastewater plant? A couple of you, what'd you think? I was pretty impressed with, with the tour that I took. Yeah, it's quite interesting. I mean, if you don't mind the smell, and if you ever want to go down there, uh, we'll be glad to take you through there, but it's, it's, it's a lot of filtration, pumping, um, bacteria that, you know, cleans the water. It's, it's kind of neat. Um, and when you go down there, I know they periodically take some of the youth groups down there and the kids always say that that's one of the most enjoyable tours that they take, other than the smell, but <laughs> after a while you get used to it, I guess. Uh, was there a trail proposed along the river to the right around that uh, treatment center at one time? There was conversation about trying to extend the trail around this way. We have a, a couple challenges. Uh, one is the terrain and, and you know the trees and the hills that are there. And then there was also some security concerns that we're worried about because if something were to happen to the wastewater site security wise, um, that would be a real problem for us. I mean, they tell us, you know, when we meet with the county and we talk about emergency management, one of the things that they emphasize is if, if your wastewater plant goes down, you're gonna have a problem because everybody relies on that, you know, like the hospitals especially. Um, they're like, that's one thing that you wanna make sure is restored as quickly as you can during a natural disaster. And I'm sure they're finding out things like that down with the hurricanes right now. Um, they're actually more worried about that than they are some of the other things that you might think they're worried about. So, but, you know, eventually there might be a trail back there. It really kind of depends on what happens, you know, with the bus bar. And so maybe we can, you know, at least get something coming through here so it loops a little bit better. Um, but, you know, we have the bridge in. We're hoping to extend the other side as we move forward and then even go the other way and come up kind of this way. Um, all the way up to Cooper's Causeway and beyond. So um, we have a, a trail network and the goal is to have it all connect. There was some legislation several years ago that makes it more challenging for us to do that. We used to be able to just acquire lands for trail through eminent domain. We can no longer do that. So we have to have a willing seller of the property. Not everybody likes to have a trail coming through their backyard. So we, we work with them whenever we see an opportunity. I know the county does the same thing. When Mike and his team are working on extending the uh, lower Yahara River Trail down to Stoughton, um, they're trying to acquire property as part of that process. And you know that could be challenging, uh, but certainly something that we always try to do. So right now, it's basically Got a dead end there, and, and eventually we would like it to loop, loop back around. Sorry, I'm fighting this cold. So, yeah, if you haven't been down there, the grandstand is kind of jacked up. Um, this is from a little while ago. Since then, they've kind of moved it back, and then, like I said, they're pouring new uh, cement pillars. There was like 30 of these um, cement pillars that was mounted to it. Hopefully, when they go to set it down, they'll all line up properly because it's got a lot of room for the air there. Well, they said you could not put it down and then put the bolts to match. If one is off an inch, everything's off. So they're going to drill holes with anchors and then they'll find the holes. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I haven't talked to the guys that are down there, but they seem like they know what they're doing. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I have no idea what it is anyways, but that's a big chunk of metal there. So, 
but it's going to create more green space and as you can see from the layout you know it's going to just really it's going to be better utilization of the space and, and better traffic flow right now it, it feels like we've just kind of piecemealed everything together down there and it'll be more orderly when it's all said and done with i think it'll be great for everybody uh, we're in the budget season um, so this is a chart that shows our net new construction, which is our growth. So you can see um, there were a lot of changes done in 2011. And when they did that, initially um, municipalities could raise taxes. It was like 2 or 3% a year, no matter whether you grew or not. Well, they changed that. So basically, you can only raise your taxes based on how much you grew. So if you go back to 2012 and 2013, we grew at less than a half a percent. And when they mean growth, it's new homes going up or new commercial buildings going up and the additional value of that for like um, property taxes. And you can see as we got in uh, the mid-20s, 2015, 2016, we started to have a little bit of growth in Stoughton. And then the last three years, we've had our three highest years ever. Um, and this year being the highest. And based on that new growth, um, we're allowed to um, raise taxes because the idea is, is if you have more homes, whatever we rate it, raise in taxes is spreading out that increase to everybody. So as an individual homeowner, you're not affected as much. And that's through the mill rate. Um, the challenging thing has been on the taxes, there, there's two things. So one is, even though the mill rate's been going down, as you know, our property values have been going up 10, 15% every year. So with your property value and your home value that's going up, most people, their, their taxes went up too. Some people, they did go down because the mill rate was enough to overcome the increased cost or the increased value of their home. The other thing that affects it is the borrowing. And, you know, even though our percentage of borrowing has been pretty consistent, the amount that we've been borrowing has gone up. And, you know, we're trying to do projects like Mant Park and all these street projects and adding trails. Um, investing um, into our buildings and things like that. So, you know, the bottom line in the budget right now is this formula that they put in there in the 2012-2013 really doesn't work because even though we can raise our taxes based on growth, the cost of everything to operate the city has gone up as well. So if we want to give what I would call a modest raise, which is 3%, of, we grew at three and a half percent. You'd think you'd be okay. Well, the trouble is our health insurance cost is going up right now. We're sitting at 12.9 percent. We're trying to get it down to 10 percent because for each percentage our health insurance goes up, the city's premium portion is for each one percent is fifteen thousand dollars. So we're looking at health insurance costs are going up more than the net new construction revenue we take in. So we're underwater. Um, plus some of our other insurances for like buildings, you know, just like your home or your car insurance has gone up like 30% in the last year. So right now we're sitting um, at a deficit for a budget, about $160,000, give or take a little bit. It's been fluctuating as we've been trying to reduce some things and find us some other things. And, you know, our goal is to have a balanced budget. The state spending limits doesn't allow us to do that. So what I propose for this year is we have a rainy day fund and we have a policy that says we need to have 25% of our value, 20 to 25% of our value in a rainy day fund. Right now we're sitting at about 33%. So we can take the $160,000 out of there and be just fine. It won't affect our bond rating or anything like that. We can balance our budget. We can't do that forever because that, <coughs> that rating day fund will start going down. It's like our savings account. We can probably do that for a couple of years, maybe three. Um, but what's going to happen, quite honestly, 
lastly, if something doesn't give at the state level, if they don't update the law here, we're going to be like other municipalities where we're going to have to go to referendum and raise taxes, just like the school district does. And right now, there's four municipalities in Dane County that are going to referendum next month. Um, Monona, Madison, uh, Fitchburg, and Middleton are all going to referendum. Sun Prairie's doing a wheel tax. That's another way you can um, help get more revenue. And then Oregon is talking about going in 2026. Uh, trying to put it off as long as we can, hoping that somehow the state will come together in a bipartisan way and recognize that the formula that's been in place the last 13 years just is not working. The school district has the same challenges, that's why they go to, to referendums as well. And especially in the labor market the way it is right now, I mean, if we're gonna keep our clerks, we have to be able to give them raises, right? <laughs> um, and and all, all of our other staff, and quite honestly, some of the some of the employees, like the clerks especially, have not been treated very well the last several years. We all treat them with respect that they deserve, but some of the politicians at the state and federal level haven't been so kind to them. They've concocted these conspiracy theories these people, you know, they put it on their sleeve when they come to work every day. They take that stuff personally. And what we've seen in the last several years, clerks, police officers, teachers, a lot of them have gotten out of the profession because of the way they've been treated and they're not really overly paid. They did it because they wanted to give back to the communities. And, you know, as a civic responsibility, they work for municipalities and government because they care about Wisconsin or Stoughton. And so we've seen a lot of folks that have retired or they've just gone into the private sector and said, I'm not gonna deal with this anymore. So, you know, this is kind of what's going on in the labor market. We have municipalities that, Fitchburg, for example, last time I talked to them, they were short eight police officers and they're gonna have five more they're going to try to hire if they pass a referendum. So they're saying that they need 13 more police officers and they just can't find them because people aren't going through the academy and they don't want to be police officers because they're working, you know, their, their shifts. Um, they do a lot of overtime. They, uh, amongst police officers, especially the divorce rate is extremely high because it's such a stressful job. <laughs> And the quality of life just isn't really there that the younger people want to enjoy. And that's really changed because of the pandemic. People are like, I don't want to do this anymore. I want my weekends, I want my nights, I want to spend time, you know, trying to keep my family together and enjoy life. So um, the labor market has really changed in the last couple of years. We're really fortunate here right now. We're knocking on wood fully staffed at our police department. We're one of the few in, in Dane County that is right now, and that really is because last year we really went through and made some adjustments. Uh, we're in the process right now of negotiating their new contract. The police still has a union. Um, we're hoping to get that settled here in the next month, and and then we can you know figure out a way to continue our growth pattern and, and hire more people. And that's part of the problem with the formula. It doesn't even allow us to maintain what we have, but if we grow, now we know we have more people, so we're probably going to have more police calls, more fire calls, more EMS calls, more people showing up to vote. We have more parks, so we have to mow more grass. We have more roads that we have to plow and maintain through the winter. And the formula doesn't allow us to hire at the rate we need in order to accommodate that growth. Um, and then for fire and EMS, what we've done is we used to rely on volunteers. Well, volunteerism is down nationwide, um, so that's become a problem. So we're, last year we hired two people to be full-time fire slash EMS, and this year we're going to hire another one. So we'll have three people that we've hired that in the past we wouldn't have to pay because volunteers would have done that work for almost free. I mean, they get paid, but it's not much. And so we're, we're paying for people that normally we would have filled those positions with volunteers. 
and our call volume is, is up. Uh, this year we're going to have over 2,000 calls in the EMS alone and probably about 400 <coughs> at the fire station. Um, so those types of things, the changing labor market, the growth, and then the lack of volunteerism are not factored into the state's formula. So what we're going to do is we're going to make the case collectively, mayor, city administrators throughout the state, that the state really needs to take another look at this and see what they can do. Um, last year they did provide us a new revenue source, which helped, but that really doesn't fix the problem. It's just a band-aid. Um, so, you know, as we get through the budget process, we'll we'll end up getting something passed that'll get us through this year, and, and then hopefully next year we can get through it. But after that, if something doesn't change, we're gonna we're gonna have to talk to the community and, and see what they want to do. They, are they willing to have their taxes raised, or do they want to eliminate some services? And if we want to eliminate the services, which ones? I mean, that's really the bottom line here. Uh, it's unfortunate, but um, you know, it's just the world we live in right now. So we're, we're looking to, to hopefully fix that at the state level because if we, we want local control. I can consider myself fiscally conservative and a responsible person, um, but there's only so much we can do. We're pretty much pulled every rabbit out of the hat that's, that's there. And I could go on for hours explaining what that is, but I don't want to bore you to death. A um, couple of new businesses are changing name of this one. So Greater Dane Financial Partners is located up by Subway on that building on the corner. So Brian Smith used to be in this building. You might recall he's a financial investor. Um, he was, I think he was thriving. Is it? Yes. So he was here, and then uh, when we decided to expand these awesome rooms here, uh, we worked with Brian to help relocate him. He found a location. And at the time, the governor had uh, received some uh, COVID money from the federal government and put together the Main Street Badger Bounce Back Grant. So any new business that opened in a vacant building was eligible to receive $10,000. So we helped Brian get $10,000 to help him with his relocation cost and the other tenants that were down here as well. That was a great program that the governor put together uh, to help promote businesses. We're hoping that um, between the state and the federal government, they'll continue to do programs like that because bringing new businesses in town basically pay for themselves because the state's going to collect sales tax for their for their sales. They're going to collect income tax for their employees. So it's a good investment for the state to do that, and I think that was one of the nice programs that came out of the pandemic. So he's changed his name recently. Um, we have a, an arcade up in the, what I call the SWAC. Does everybody know where the SWAC is? Mm -hmm. So the SWAC is um, up on the corner um, before, you, before you get to Walmart, <coughs> kind of down in the corner down there, and they have the gyms in there. They have the wellness clinic in there. We actually had one election in there during the pandemic, so I Everybody had to go there and vote. And Famous Yeti's located in there in the last couple of years and they've opened an arcade in there. Uh, Stone Health is in there right now too with their physical therapies in that building. And there's a, an eye clinic in there that's where you get my glasses from. And then uh, the liquor store on Pay Street just opened in the last couple days. So they had to change their ownership for the whole strip mall. And then they have a new uh, a liquor store there. So that's, that's opened up so they're good to go. A um, couple things at the senior center. Um, I don't know, is anybody taking advantage of this? Uh, if not, that's something that you or your loved one could do. Um, and it looks like they still have a few more um, events coming up here in October, November, and December. Um, there's a resource center of the library and senior center and started our partnering. And then a music appreciation series is going on. I went to one of them, it was awesome. Um, so we're not even halfway through them yet. So these are at Monday at the Opera House at three o'clock in the afternoon. The shows are free, they'll accept donations if, if you're sitting there. Uh, but they have a wide variety of talent that comes in from universities, high schools, or just people that are performing. So it's a really nice event, it's an hour show. And that's all I have. Are there any questions?
questions today? Go ahead. Notice that the old theater downtown, they have a uh, what, cider factory or whatever. Mm -hmm. Are they ever going to fix that? Uh, there's a board up there that's made of uh, a particle board that's all deteriorating. It certainly would have helped Main Street if it, something could be done there. I yeah, I talked to the building owner oh, was last fall, and he was down there one day with a window company and I can follow up with him and find out and I'll tell him. I've had other businesses down there provide similar feedback. I think he was planning on taking that all out of there and then putting in some glass instead. Um, I'm not really sure where they're at in the process, if they got materials ordered or if it's on hold or what's going on. I can check on that. Question. Even when, when they when they put the uh, roundabout in by Unity Point Health Clinic, yeah. and how you get to the to the the SWAC, what you call the SWAC, yeah, they kind of screwed that up because it's really difficult to get to the SWAC. SWAC. You almost have to go in the back way. Yeah, I was just seeing. I don't have a I don't have a picture. Of it. Um, yeah. So that was part of the. The DOT project, and I know when they went to design that, they have to have a certain distance from Main Street or a highway to the end of the roundabout. So we lost a little frontage road there, and we talked to them extensively because I know the building order of the SWAC was really concerned about that, and they're just like, "This is our standard, and we can't really deviate because the concern is if we get." A couple people that are trying to turn there for whatever reason they're backed up they'll be backed up all the way on the main street and create a real bottleneck there so you know we encourage people to use other ways of getting in there but yeah it's not very convenient and we've had those conversations with the DOT and it's basically in their in their rules that they have to have that distance from the from the highway well then there could be some kind of sign or something that could be put up to let people know how to get that. Yeah, that's something I, I could talk to the property owner about. I mean, you can still get there, but you have to go all the way down and hang a left and come in through yeah, that right. little alleyway, which is not ideal. I, mean, I agree with you. Or drive through the Unity Point clinic, uh, which they don't get. Yeah, well, I try to encourage them to work with Unity Point. <laughs> And maybe reroute that frontage road to between Unity Point and the condos that are beyond there, and try to put some in there. But I don't think they wanted to spend the money to do it. And I, I don't know if there was enough space there. But you know, we did try to make some suggestions. But you know, they didn't want to spend the money, and we didn't feel like it was the city's responsibility to spend taxpayers' money on that. Well, signage would help. Sure. People go down to Jackson and left and then left again. Yeah. Yeah, usually when I go there, I'll, that's the route I'll go, or I'll, if I do go down, you know, like Kingsland and down that way, um, or come in over by even Roby and take the back way. There's a few ways of getting there, and for the locals, we know it, but if they're coming from out of town, especially for like a tournament, it is really challenging. Yeah, and they have a lot of tournaments there, I think. Basketball yeah, they do, especially in the winter time. Sure. Any other questions? Just a follow up on the Land Park. Uh, those black lines where all the uh, roads are going in, is there like a desire to get those in this before winter? Those pretty much the paved areas? Yeah, so the hope is to get this part here. In, in the winter, um, and we have to get this internal part done. Everything that's in the red is, is what we're, so this is all within the red here, all of this stuff. So what would be left over basically would be this parking lot here, so we have to take off the softball line in here. So this will more than likely hopefully be done in the spring. We'll see if the weather cooperates. And then the trail 
would be done in the spring as well. We're trying to coordinate the trail with some work we're trying to do in the river, river right now. And we have had a couple meetings with the DNR and we've applied for um, successfully for one permit for the river and that's to put a trail in that would go underneath the bridge. Um, there's a couple other features that we want to put in the river, some rock features that we're in the process of finishing up some engineering so we can submit that application for that permit. We would like to have the DNR approve that over the winter so some of that work we could do before we put the trail in because we don't want to put the trail in and then be driving over it with a big excavator you know in the next year or two so it's so, been, the, so the uh, black top around by the pickle courts would probably be higher priority this year yet it really depends on the weather okay. but yeah they're they're trying to get to the bus marks for sure right yeah because they have to get in and out of there and then the, like i said this this parking lot area here and then this trail up here so that'll probably be in the spring and they'll leave you know the road in here until they know for sure that they're going to get the rest of that loop done we can't we can't box them in there i don't think the school district would be too happy with me if we did that but i, I think the plan turned out really well um and then we have some opportunity for the future to make even more improvements but i think the biggest thing is like i said everything was kind of piecemeal down there we got rid of some buildings that were there that were just storage basically and junk to create more green space kind of the area where it says food and then you can see by turning the, the grandstand because before they were like this so we were losing this whole corner of green space there so by just turning the grandstand we pick all of that up so if we have a large event out there we can have more people in lawn chairs or we can put a stage out there or whatever um, and then with more parking we think it'll be safer it'll help the event uh, i know the ice rink they're really excited about it because they have tournaments there as well and parking is always a challenge we do have this uh, parking lot here that serves the aquatic center, so sometimes they use that as overflow as well. But if you've been out there during the fair, you can see there's cars parked up and down the streets, and we'll probably still have some of that, but I think it'll be uh, better for them as well. And it'll be interesting to see um, how they lay out the midway, especially um, when the project is done. Yes. You have a question? There's some um, boarded up frontage on downtown next to I think Diaconus, a building down there, the whole front is boarded up. Do you know what's going on there in that building? Yeah, so that's a building that um, I think it was it was Giggles and it was at Selmos before that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we had a, a couple that bought the building and they were going to remodel it and then they ended up buying the uh, place in Paoli, uh, Seven Acres Dairy. Is anyone there yeah. so they bought that building and that building turned into this huge project because there was a lot of historical preservation and then they uh, you know they put in the restaurant and then they put an outdoor area so they decided you know what we've got enough to do all here we're going to sell the building so they sold the building to I'm going to say a family member or a friend so they are doing two things and the upstairs they're working on putting in like short-term rentals or some people who call them Airbnbs and then on the downstairs they're, they're remodeling the, the interior of the downstairs and they basically boarded it up so they could take the front window out and keep all the dust from blowing on the road and not have everything exposed. I haven't been in there for a while so I don't know what kind of progress they're making. There's a couple of young guys that are in there and they have some contractors. They've done some historical preservation on the outside of the building so um, eventually, their goal is for that lower part to have it ready so they can rent it out to a retail business. But at this point, I'm not aware that if they're talking to anybody specifically about doing that. No time frame? No time frame. I mean, they, last time I talked to them, they said they were hoping to have it done by the fall. And it's good to be fall, so we'll see if they're on schedule. But 
we all know how that goes, just like road projects, sometimes they don't get done on time. Um, and you know, some of the other businesses downtown are just about ready to open. I know the former Laz is building, they're looking for employees right now. Water Street Tavern is just about done. I, I don't have open dates for either one of them. Um, I'm still hoping that Oslo Sentence will relocate, they're closed now. Um, and they hope to have a new tenant in there. Uh, I'm not really sure who that's going to be. I've been told that if they, if the deal goes through, it'll be some sort of a retail, but I have no idea. So the good news is, is that we, most of our buildings are full. The ones that are full right now, there's a reason they're in transition, they're remodeling, whatever. So our downtown is actually, um, you know, thriving right now. It's been really good. And coming out of the pandemic, I wasn't really sure how it was going to go. Uh, but having, you know, things in place like the, the Main Street grant I mentioned earlier, the city's been helping some of the property owners. Uh, we have a, two revolving loan funds that we put together. So they get low interest loans to do the remodels. And that's helped uh, some of the on some of the lead pipe removal, we use um, federal money that we received during COVID to help the businesses, nine of them, um, pay for upgrading their piping from lead pipe to you know regular pipe so they're safer. Um, we also have some money available right now, about 100000 that we set aside of federal money to help downtown businesses if they need to upgrade their water line. So we have at least two of them that want to do that because the water line, maybe it's a two inch water main and they need a four, six or eight. Um, so we're going to help them pay for that because we want them to do that now before they redo Main Street so they don't have to patch a new road basically. And some of them need to be upgraded. So if, if they want to do work on a second floor and they have to put in a sprinkler system, they need a bigger water pipe. So we've been working really hard um, with the businesses to try and provide them resources to make it more cost effective for them to invest in their buildings. It might be an update for the, the Water Street Tavern. I saw a huge beer truck unloading beer. Oh, <laughs> that's a good size. Size. That's a good size. Do you have a question? Yeah, just pointing out we have a new bookstore in town. They just opened a couple weeks ago. Oh, I haven't been in it yet. Yeah. Where is that? It's um it's the actually it's right there. Right it's on the road. it's just across the river on the other right side of the building with yeah. the mural. And it's um new and some used and uh the family is moving to Stoke. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So it's, it's Yeah, I'll have to get that one on my list. I know. Yeah that some of the other businesses like the, uh, the dairy land um, and then there's a, a business over I talked about the last time on Page Street the place that sells uh, like um, sewing materials um, oh, yeah. the hungry hippie or whatever I can't remember the name of it <laughs> uh, um, those are other uh, businesses that have opened up and they're moving here as well, which is encouraging. They have local business owners and people actually moving from other yeah. municipalities to Stoughton to open their businesses. Yeah, it's great. Right, right. So I'll have to get over there, I'll have to get them on my list. You know what the name of it is? Ink Cap. Ink Cap? Okay. I'll have to look for that one. I try to highlight them, so maybe I'll get that one on there for next month. I haven't seen a sign on their building yet. Do they put one on there yet? I, I don't it's know. It's just in the window. Yes, yeah, just. Yeah. I'll check it out. Thanks yeah. for that. Yeah, they opened um, the week, the day of Art Walk. So it's just been a couple of weeks. Yeah, that was a busy day, too. Yeah, yeah. It but yeah, it's the day. first business when you cross the bridge. Yeah. On the okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any other questions or anything you want to share with me? It's always good to get feedback. And I know I learned probably more than you guys do when I come to these things. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Try to come back and you know address the, the things that you talked about as much as I can. If not, I do. We do have some applications. Yes, the applications oh. time dropped off. Okay. Do you have a question? Yeah, about some tree trimming, especially going down Rolling Road. Um, there's stop signs, but there's tree branches 
Uh, what part of Roby? How far off are you? Um, about two blocks from the owner, I have to say. Is it closer to Page or closer to the high school or beyond? Probably closer to the high school. Okay. We can drive by there and look. I know the some of the trees we trim ourselves and our public works guys are trained to do that. We have a city forester. If there's power lines, we usually contract those out. Um, and they, they have zones. So I think it's like a five year rotation where they do a zone every year and then they go to the next one and eventually yeah, they come back. Yeah, you can see this house until you get right up to it. So. Yeah, so I, I'll have to dangerous. talk to public works. And I'll try to drive by there and so it's it's up toward the high school. What side of the road will it be on if I go up? It'll be on the uh, west side of the road. The west side of the road. Okay. I'll, usually what I do is I snap a picture and then I send it out to public works and try to give them like an intersection so that yeah. they can go out and look. But thank you for that. Yeah. Um, anybody else? So yeah, the, you have the applications are here. If you want to sign up uh, for the polls, we appreciate that. And you can take one with you. You can fill out one here. I can stick around for a little while. Um, otherwise, um, you can give them to Cindy or drop them off at City Hall. So thank you again for being here. Thank you. Thank you.